Hi everyone. Welcome to the Knowles Baptist Church. God bless you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all the blessings you give us. May we appreciate everything you do for us, and may we walk with you every day. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Oh God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you. Oh God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you. I will seek you in the morning, and I will learn to walk in your ways, and step by step you lead me, and I will follow you all of my days. I will follow you all of my days. I will follow you all of my days, and step by by step you lead me, and I will follow you all of my days. God, please guide me and guide us and direct us as we learn from you again. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Acts chapter 2. A very beautiful passage that gives us an amazing account of a hugely historical event 2,000 years ago, the Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came down. Acts 2.42 says this, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, and all the who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. The title of our message, Loving Togetherness, or Love and Togetherness. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word and thank you for your messages. May we truly fall in love with you. Fall in love with each other. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. As we've talked about, this text gives us a perfect understanding of what was going on when the Holy Spirit came down upon the people that were right, it was right after Jesus had ascended to heaven. He promised the Holy Spirit would come and be the great teacher that was. He would do so much more than he could do because he was limited in a sense, by the fact he's walking around, the Holy Spirit is all over the place. And so God was letting us know that there would be a teacher coming to be with us, and that teacher was the Holy Spirit, and that teacher had a huge impact. And here we have it. We go down here. This is what's important. We go down to, we had all, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. Or let's go back up. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. So you have people in awe over the move of the Holy Spirit, watching what God was doing. And these were visual accounts so that they could say, yes, I saw it happen. I mean, it's, it's almost like if you're in a church service and there is a moment when people start to move forward, and we're talking not just one or two, but 20 or 30 or 40, just suddenly move forward because they can't help it. 
that is I, that is where you see a move of the spirit. Many years ago, I went to a church service, and uh, I think it was in Indiana. It was a Baptist church, and it was an unusual experience because the man who was the pastor of the church, I mentioned this to you before, uh, was Jack Hiles. He's in heaven. But he was the pastor of First Baptist Church in Indiana. He was known for leading a church which had the largest bus ministry in the world. 100,000 people came to his, his church services, especially Sunday school. That's what they said. Buses lined the parking lots. There were just so many buses going across the city, picking people up for Bible school. During one of the services, I was absolutely stunned. He would preach, and he had when he preached, he had a cough. He'd go, <laughs> Excuse me. I'm not trying to mock him. That's what he preached. He found the pulpit. He was a fire and brimstone preacher. At the end of his sermon, I was in stunned when I saw a couple hundred people come down and running to, running to the altar. I mean, he didn't say, if you need to come to the altar, put your hand up. He didn't say, put your hand up if you've been touched, but you just didn't serve church service you were. A person says, uh, uh, now go ahead. I, I feel led by God to ask you this question. Have you been have you been touched by this service? And people put it, and I sense God wants you to come forth. No, no, it was nothing like that. This was like instant. As soon as he was done preaching, they ran forward. And I was like, wow. That's visible to me. Well, so is this. A visible manifestation of what the Spirit of God was doing at this time. Now look what he says right here. He says, and, and all who believed were together and all had all faith. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. All who believed were together and had all things in common. Now, that is a phrase that can catch people off guard because it, it's for us Americans, it looks a little bit off. Had all things in common? But what it really is saying is that even though you have something, you don't consider yourself the most important person on the planet. I remember one time a uh, news commentator talked about this one senator, and I won't mention the senator's name. He said, uh, oh, Larry has a great heart. He's known to be the kind of person that would give you the shirt off his back. Now, you probably have heard that phrase before. He said, they give you the shirt off their back. They would give you Whatever they have. There are people like that. They would do that. And, but at the same time, what he's talking about is the fact that we have things in common. I have this. Yes, I purchased this the other day. It's mine. But if you need it, just ask me for it. I'll, I'll let you have it. Or I'll maybe let you have it for a little while. It's not saying that we don't own anything. It's just that we don't hold the ownership so much to our best that we just say, ah, 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 not yours, mine. We hold all things in common, which means we are here for each other. That's why the title of the message is Love and Togetherness. Because God wants to communicate that we are here for each other. And a true Bible-believing church is like that. We want to see ourselves as being a part of a body of believers who truly loves one another. And friends, that is absolutely essential. Look what he says right here. He says, And all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing them. We talked about this last time in terms of if there's a need out there. And friends, 
It ain't hard to find me. Now, some people will suggest that the church is supposed to just give stuff away. And I would argue that the Bible doesn't want us to be just giving everything away. God wants us to meet people's needs. Now, what I mean by that is this. We are supposed to work. Work was established in the very beginning. Adam and Eve were supposed to be working. That's right. Adam and Eve had a garden of Eden, and God gave them the responsibility of taking care of that garden. And since that was a heck of a piece of land, they were going to be busy all their life working that garden. And they had a bunch of animals to take care of. When the fall happened, they still had the task of working, but now they were going to work by the sweat of their face because of the sin that entered the world. So work has always been a part of who we are. So if someone is just lazy and not saying, they're going, oh, I'm not going to do anything, you're going to take care of me, God says, no. That's not the purpose of this. The purpose is to help those who are genuinely trying to make it happen but they're falling short. God says we are going to make sure you meet your needs. And that's what the purpose is. Now, remember when Jesus said, you'll always have the poor among you? He was saying that so that the naysayers and the accusers would shut their mouths. Because that's what always people say. Well, look at the poor people. Are there. They need to be taken care of. The poor will be, the poor will always be. Don't change the subject. Don't try to make excuses. Do what God commands you to do. And in this case, he wants us to be a one mind, one body, one Lord. Together. As a body of believers. He says right here, which is absolutely fascinating. And day by day, attending the temple together, and breaking bread in their homes. Attending temple together and breaking bread in their homes. God wants us to get together in person. Now, I, I mentioned our church a couple of times recently because some will say, wait a second, aren't you going against this? Remember, the ministry of this church is to those people who have been hurt badly and they need have a way to connect with the Lord. And so this church gives them the opportunity. We pray that one day they will return to the personal, in-person worship service. And there are also those people whose schedules were just absolutely, maybe they were two or three jobs, maybe they got to take care of family, loved ones. This, we hope, will touch their life and minister to them and help them get close to the Lord. And there's also the people who are active at their local church, and they wish they had just a little more teaching. Well, again, we hope and pray we are ministering to those people. But the point is this. God wants all, his perfect will is that we gather together in person. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And even though this opportunity is here for people to take in the word of God, God wants, his perfect will is, that everybody walk into that temple, walk into that sanctuary, sit down, or move around and meet people, and lift up praises to God, and hear the word of God, and sing songs and pray. That's what his will is. And he will continue to work on hearts, and work on minds, to get people to the point where they will come back to church. Friends, I guarantee you, for those people who are not actively involved in their Bible reading church, the Lord is working on their heart to make sure that they start to change their mind and decide that they want to get back in church. I guarantee you that is what God is doing because that is how he works. As he says right here, and day by day attending the temple, they were involved with their body of believers. Right? And here, look what it says right here. Something's interesting. He says, and day by day, and attending the temple, and breaking bread in their homes. Breaking bread in their homes. What was going on? They were meeting in house church. They, were, yeah, they didn't have the mega churches in those days. Now, granted, 3,000 were saved in one day. 
And so it can be said that at one point there was a gathering of 3,000 believers at one time, and that was perfectly fine. But in terms of the day-to-day ministry of learning the Word of God and praying and studying Scripture and uh, getting close to one another, there were people in houses doing that. That's how they were gathering. They did not have a big coliseum to meet in. If anything, the Colosseums, I'm trying to figure where I went to, I think the Colosseums were beforehand, I think. I might have my dates mixed up. But if anything, the Colosseum might scare them away because they'd have, they would know that's where they killed these people. You know, they probably wouldn't want to go there. But the point is this these are people gathering in homes and they're having that time of fellowship, they're having that prayer time of personal connection, they're having that time of togetherness, love and togetherness. They are spending time with each other. They are getting to know each other. They are praying for each other. They're studying the word together. They are lifting and praising God, lifting up the name of Jesus, and they're praising God together. That is what was happening in this time. And then he says, there's something that's absolutely fantastic. He says, he says, and breaking bread in homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. They received their food with glad. They were Thankful to God for just the fact they had food to eat. And I, I'm going to tell you a side note here. Uh, my family usually says a prayer in the evening, a prayer for our food. I don't want to, I'm not, but I'm not mentioning it's right. I, just, I feel like it fits here. And the reason we do it is we want to give thanks to God for what we're eating. Now, I will tell you that normally I don't say a prayer for breakfast or for lunch. And it's mainly because, and this may sound completely bizarre to you, I don't want it to be a ritual. It's, in a way, it is a ritual at night because we, we want to say a few words, thank God for what we have. But I am a little bit leery of, well, let's say a prayer before we eat. You got, I, Especially in a, in a restaurant, you, you know how Christians go to a restaurant and eat lunch. There's almost always somebody's let's say a prayer, and they're mostly sincere. I'm sure they are, but it gets a little bit. I get a little nervous around that because I I don't really like public praying that much. I believe prayer is in your closet. Now, granted, if I'm in a restaurant and I hear somebody praying, I go, oh, good, 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 good Christians. I, I would say that too. But you got to be careful because you're not trying to be like those Pharisees in the New Testament. Lord, I just pray that you bless this food and see, see here, I hear folks that you're seeing on bread. That it gets a little bit into the flesh, and that's why I get a little bit leery of that. The point is that what we really look forward to doing, what we look forward to doing, is having a time for us in the evening when we can say, God, thank you, please bless this food. But right now, God is saying this, be grateful for it, dear God. Be grateful for the food that you have. Give thanks to God for that food. Thank the Lord that you have a, a, a way to keep, your, a, keep a decent living. Thank the Lord that you have the needs that you have met, and probably more than above your needs. Give praise to Him, because that is is a such an important blessing. I told you once before about a buddy named my name Jason. If we were in college one day and he said, Hey, did you realize that we live in a country where if you just live in America, you're already way above the worldwide average in terms of income? And when he said that I go, see you later, Jason, I don't need it. But he was making a really good point and I just was dismissing it. And that is so many of us here in our country, our nation, America, have it so much better than 90% of the world. And you know what we complain about? Slow internet. The other people are praying they can just get their get the water going. We're blessed. And God says, Give thanks for that. 
togetherness in love is God's intention for us to have. He wants us to have that. It says right here, and this is verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people. Praising God and having favor with all the people. Now that to me is an absolutely fascinating two words. I say that because of this. All of my Christian life, I have been in most, I'd say, solid Bible-believing churches. I have been very fortunate. Um, everyone. Even the churches that weren't as... The one church I had that kind of maybe a little more philosophical, they still had lo a loving pastor, and they were he was teaching the Bible, and he was doing his best to teach the Bible. But I have found that I have been so blessed to be in solid Bible-believing churches. And what I find absolutely fascinating is that in those churches, the expectation is that the world hates us. You are going to be persecuted, we're told, for your faith. You are going to be condemned because you believe in Jesus. You are going to be cast aside because you preach the gospel. And I hear that. And then at the same time, I would see the Bible telling me to love somebody and reach out to them and minister to their needs. I, I do my best. And what I personally found out when I when I when I did that stuff, then I got along with people. And I was like, wait a second. I, well, I, aren't I supposed to be persecuted? Or aren't they supposed to beat me up? Now, don't get me wrong. I have a tendency to push people's buttons the way I do things sometimes. And I'm not saying I'm a very popular guy. I'm really not. But I will confess to you that I'm very fortunate. I have not yet been thrown into a lake for my faith. <laughs> Hasn't happened yet. We usually hear about the persecution and the fact that we're going to be condemned. But what does he say right here? He says, praising God and having favor with all the people. Now, that can certainly mean the body of believers, for sure. But I'm thinking he's saying the people around us. Which means there must be something about the way we live our life as a dedicated Christian that causes people to say, wow, I, I like these people. Now, granted, it gets a little dicey when you start telling people Jesus saves that he's the only way, and you'll be going to hell if you don't accept him. You might just lose a neighbor after that. They may not want to talk to you for a while, or forever. But we are commanded to go teach all the go into the world and all nations. But here's the thing. In general, if we're meeting people and we're loving them, and we are just letting the Holy Spirit work through us, and we're focusing our hearts on the Lord, then doesn't that make sense that there's going to be a certain amount of love of God that's coming through us if we are doing what we're supposed to be doing, and people are going to appreciate that? Now, it gets a little tough when you start to tell them Jesus is the only way, but still there's that at least a partial way they are thinking, man, you're, you're, a, you're a good person. And so God is saying, you'll find favor. Because you are living for the Lord, you're loving the Lord, you're loving others, they can see your walk, you are someone with integrity, you are someone with character, you are someone that lives a life that's honest and worthy of the calling of God, and it gives you are, you are an example of the Word of God, and who can fault you for that? And so it is a good idea to be as focused on that love and togetherness that we were talking about, that 
loving God, loving others, being together in one, the idea that we are turning our hearts to Jesus and doing our best to listen to him every day. And it says right here, he says, praising God and having favor with all the people. And day by day, they attending the uh, temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. God is saying, if you are willing to allow yourselves to thank God and be close to him and learn about him and love each other, you're going to see how God really works. And friends, love and togetherness in the Christian community is a beautiful part if not a byproduct of that connection with the Lord. Being born again, following Him, doing His commands, loving Him and loving others should give us the opportunity of love and togetherness. And with that, the ability to see people get saved, as it says right here. And the Lord added to their number day by day. The Lord added to their number of those who are being saved. Because of the fact these people were living the Word of God and loving through the Word of God, those people who were touched by them were much more willing to have to listen to what they were saying because of their actions, because of who they, how they acted, how they treated people. They were much more willing to listen to that gospel and accept it because the life of Christ was living within them. Love and togetherness. That is something that we all can have as a part of who we are. And it's something that allows us to live the walk we live a life for Christ and fulfill what we saw at Pentecost two thousand years ago. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love, for your mercy, and I just ask you to guide and direct us every day. May you walk with us, and may you give us the direction that we need. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. I encourage you right now to say, Jesus, come into my heart and be my Savior, if you're not a Christian. And Christians, remember, love and togetherness making sure that we're really connected to God and making sure the love of God flows through us to others. That is what God is really looking forward to. As we sing the song of invitation, decide for Jesus today. Just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blot to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Friend, I hope you accepted Christ your Savior. If not, please do so soon. And Christian, remember to love God and love others and make sure that the love and togetherness that God is expecting is a part of who we are. Well, folks, we are the Knowles Baptist Church. I'm blessed to pray that you are in connection with the Lord, you're studying the Word of God like you should. Easter's coming up in a couple weeks, so we just pray that God... Actually, yeah, wait, Easter next weekend, isn't it? Right, about a week from now. So I pray that you are connecting with the Lord and uh, getting as close to Him as possible. I think we're getting slowly out of the winter season into nice weather, so we thank God for that. And uh, may I remind you, we have a website. It's https colon backslash backslash the Knowles Baptist Church dot my dot canva dot site backslash KBC and you can find us on X, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, and TikTok. Check us out, please. As we pray, we close. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time with you. May we walk with you and be close to you every day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us, friends. May God bless you.